Okay. Uh I I'm just going to I'm just going to let you know right now I don't I can't hear a goddamn thing I'm playing. So hopefully this sounds good. Let's just start this off right. Uh bada bing bada boom. Welcome to Movie Loaf. Welcome to Movie Loaf. Oh, with some technical assistance, you can put together a dynamite fuck bill. Okay, I'm going to assume that that theme song was heard around the world. I, I can't hear dick today. I don't know what the deal is. But you know what? Fuck OBS. We're making art, man. We're, make, we're making art. And you know who else said fuck it and just made art? Jess fucking Franco. That's who we're talking about mostly today. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I hope that I'm, I'm audible right now. <laughs> um, we're actually going to do a quick, quick check a Rooney just to see... What exactly got going on here? Let's see. Oh, you heard it just fine? Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Because I, I, I ain't got dick on my end, yo. I ain't got dick on my end. I don't know why that is, but here we are. Uh, so, uh, welcome to another episode of... Uh, let me actually start recording. That's a good idea. Um, let's... <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, the second episode, uh, officially... Of Movie Loaf. This is uh, a podcast ostensibly just made up of other podcast ideas smushed together. It is Movie Loaf, and today we're talking about uh, a couple things. We have we have two ingredients in today's loaf. Uh, first off, we have Shutter Vision, and then we will have the special premiere of The Franco Files. Yes, sir, Bob, The Franco Files. And uh, this is um, this is interesting because this is going to be. Uh, these are two segments you're going to see a lot, and I would dare say you're probably going to see the latter more than the former. This is one that is kind of a current obsession of mine. I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to, 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 to get into it. Um, let's see here. I'm going to see what YouTube is yelling at me about right now. Because there's always something. Current bit rate is lower than recommended. Shocking. Simply shocking. Let's do the old speed test. See what we got going on. Doop a doo doo. Ba da dee doo ba. Whoop a dee boop ba doo doo. I was going to do a piano thing just now, but it's not hooked up because I'm a fucking loser. We can't get anything right. God damn it. All right. So let's see where we're at here. Eh, we got a pretty good, we got a pretty good bit right going. I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. This looks fine. Jesus. All right. So. Let's uh, let's just dig in. This is going to be. I'm trying to keep these at an hour, <laughs> and I, I I wrote a lot down for the Franco file segment. So we're just going to get in to our first segment, uh, and that is Shutter Vision, which I just realized I don't have a theme for. So let's insert that into the into the audio version of the podcast. Boopity do 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 do. It's Shutter Vision. It's Shutter Vision. It's Shutter Vision, and it's a thing where I talk about Shutter movies uh, that are on Shutter. Maybe not made by Shutter, but at least on Shutter right now. Doopity doopity pop a doop boop pop boobity boo. Bow. That's that's my Shutter Vision song. <laughs> so Shutter Vision. Um, so I watched two movies that are on Shutter in the last uh, last week, week and a half. And uh, one of them I watched on Shutter. The other one I already had on Blu-ray, and I decided it was a good time to check it out. Um, now, the first one is Random Acts of Violence. Now, this is a film uh, written and directed by Jay Baruchel. Uh, Jay Baruchel is well known as kind of the um, part of that, like, Seth Rogen Canadian uh, tribe of comedians. And uh, he, uh, you know, he got into a bit of trouble on Twitter. Um, he, some, some of the, uh, uh, words he used to sell the film to investors were, uh, hmm, uh, well, they, they, they were not, uh, appreciated 
by by Twitter. Uh, Twitter, as we know, is a very very uh, uh, displeased uh, group of individuals who just uh, love to love to shit on the lives of others, and they decided to shit on the li- life of Jay Baruchel. And it turns out, yeah, he was just he was just trying to sell his movie, which is something a lot of filmmakers do. And um, you know, the movie itself was unequivocally one hundred percent fine i guess i mean it was it was not a not a not a great film i wouldn't say i would not say that he gave us a marvelous piece of horror um you know uh, uh mastery uh he is he is certainly not the next wes craven based on this sole effort uh but there is potential there you know he made a very pretty film he made a film that has some pretty good sequences there's a sequence uh with a bunch of people in a car, and they all get murderized by our killer, and it's a really good scene. Um, and there are some pretty nice moments that definitely feel like that sort of newer, um, I don't even know what to call it, this kind of newer era of horror, this kind of hereditary era, where we kind of um, have these uh, scenes that focus on morbid imagery, and there's a lot of silence and taking in the atmosphere, which is nice. Um, there's a great bit with a dead dog that I really thought was very good. Um, and he actually got a really uh, solid performance out of Jordana Brewster. Uh, there's a scene where she basically has to um, face the fact that she is uh, very mortal. And uh, the way that she kind of puts, and this is it's hard to describe without spoiling the film, but uh, the way that she uh, describes uh, the uh, feeling and the way that she explains how she wants to potentially spend her last moments uh, to a character. It really hit. It really hit. And I was really excited by that writing and that acting. Unfortunately, it really doesn't uh, it doesn't come up a lot in the film. This is very much a kind of meta horror film. And I... I'm not a big fan of meta horror films. I don't hate them. I liked, uh, you know, Cabin in the Woods, which is much, much more meta than this film. Um, but I, I do like certain meta films. But you ha- you really have to nail the mix. This one, um, it doesn't try too hard to be meta. It's more that it it takes on subject matter that I don't think it's prepared to take on, and I don't think it has a full understanding of. And yeah, I, it, it's based on a comic book. I have not read that comic book. Maybe the comic book is great. I don't know. I'm 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 just some some asshole on the internet. But um, you know I I don't know. There is a certain laziness to aspects of the film, and I wouldn't say that the whole film is lazy. I think he he, he tried his best and he did a pretty good job for a reasonably large amount of it. Um, but there is a laziness inherent to it. It does not again does not feel like a script that was really thought through fully. Um, it doesn't feel like it ever tries to go beyond kind of it doesn't try to go beyond anything we've seen before while also putting forth a voice that suggests it is going beyond a certain point. Um, And I think that 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 trips it up because it, it tries to be this very like philosophically challenging film and then is just kind of a slasher movie with not enough slashings in it. Um, but that being said, the gore is really good when it occurs. Performances are solid, uh, well shot. It's just kind of lazy. I really hated that the comic book inside of the movie looks like total ass. I know that's a very silly thing to get worked up over, but it just kind of looks like ass, guys. And I don't know why you would do that when you have, I assume, a perfectly good comic book artist on hand to make a comic book for you. Um, I don't know. You know, again, I don't know exactly what the deal was going in, but ugh, 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 ugh. not a uh, not great, but not bad. Just kind of bleh, just kind of bleh. Um, but I do feel bad for Jay Parrish. Uh, the other film I watched from Shutter, uh, the one I own on Blu-ray already, is Color Out of Space: Richard Stanley's Triumphant Return to uh, to filmmaking. Um, well, it's narrative filmmaking. He's made documentaries over the years, um, but his his return to actual narrative. Uh, reasonably well-budgeted uh, horror cinema. And um, man, it's fucking 
awesome. I, I kept putting this off for so long because I actually, I remember I, I almost got the chance to see it in theaters. I was playing in theaters in Vegas for one night, and I was so excited. And then it did not, um, it did not line up with my schedule. I think it was around the time. I, I think I was still, I, it was, I was dealing with my son and it was just, there was no good time to go to the theater. I think that's what happened. I might be miss I, time is an illusion now. Uh, but either which way I didn't get to see it in theaters. I was very sad about that. I picked it up on Blu-ray when it came out and I just let it sit because I was worried, man. I like, I didn't want to be let down by a Richard Stanley joint. I did not want to be let down by what looked like an awesome HP Lovecraft adaptation. I just was so worried. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of criticism I saw online that was negative, but there's also a lot of good stuff. And I was like, fuck, what if the good ones are just being sycophants? And, oh, geez. And then it turns out it's really fucking great. Uh, I've, I don't think I've seen a better Lovecraft, like direct adaptation. Well, at least I haven't seen a better adaptation of the more cosmic uh, aspects of Lovecraft's bibliography. Uh, obviously, Reanimator is probably the best, like, Lovecraft movie. But as far as just, like, the best, like, taken from that, that line of just cosmic horror stories, Call Out of Space is easily my favorite. It's an amazing piece of work. Uh, and it even gets Nick Cage's Vampire's Kiss accent, which apparently Richard Stanley actually asked Nick Cage to do the Vampire's Kiss accent, which I am flabbergasted by. Um, I really, uh, I would, I would love to be on set the day where Richard Stanley comes up, uh, to Nicolas Cage and says, I, I really like, I can't do his accent. Uh, I'd really like you to do your, uh, your vampire's kiss accent. And Nick Cage being like, really? And, uh, just letting it go. And it's, it's interesting. The way it's utilized is actually really smart. I didn't pick up on it at first, but the way he utilizes his vampire's kiss accent in very specific scenes works exceptionally well it does i i can see it taking people out of the movie i know some people have really not liked the very nicholas cage-ness of the film they feel caged in um but i i gotta say i really i don't have any serious issues with the film it is beautiful to look at the way that richard stanley uh envisions these very heady concepts is downright breathtaking, very imaginative. There are moments near the end that just feel ripped straight out of a Lovecraft story. Um, he does add his own special brand. One of the characters is a, uh, a witch. And uh, I, think he, I think he's a Wiccan. I'm not good at these terms. But um, there's a whole like witchcraft angle to it that is very much a Richard Stanley element. Uh, and of course, you got Tommy Chong as this like weird stoner um, uh, uh, oh shoot, the word for someone who's uh, living out in the woods. Um, and uh, he's great. Uh, not in the movie nearly enough, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, zero fucks given throughout the entire movie. There's one thing that happens um, in the back half that is one of the most horrifying things I've seen in a like modestly budgeted film, uh, I think, ever. And I was shocked that they went there and shocked that they went even further with it. And I, I really hope not hippie Dom. I, he's not a hippie. Um, this didn't show up again. Did it? Jesus Christ. Um, so, so um, yeah, I, <laughs> I just really, I really enjoy this one. I don't want to really spoil anything. Um, it is, there we go. There's the comments. Um, it is aggressively good, and I need to move on anyway because this is this is taking forever. So let's let's go ahead and let's let's move on.
Okay, I don't actually know where that clip ends because I can't hear it. But anyway, we're going to talk about Francophiles. Do 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 Francophiles. Uh, C. A. Hall asks if you made a film that was considered so bad it's good, would that really be worse than making something that is forgettable? I would say that making something that is forgettable would be much much worse than something that is so bad it's good. Um, and that's one reason I was not a big fan of Random Acts of Violence. But we're moving on to the Franco Files. Uh, for this segment, we'll be cataloging the films of Jess Franco. So this is going to be a very long-standing segment for the show. Um, me, uh, Movie Loaf is, is meant to be a bunch of long-term uh, segments, but this one is truly long-term. It is no easy task. Um, by Stephen Thrower's count, if we're not including retitled flicks on the same movie with a few shots uh, uh if we're not including retitled flicks or the same movie with a few shots added then the total breadth 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 i've never said that word out loud before breadth of uh franco's work consists of 182 movies and if you don't do that if you actually consider like every release with his name stamped on it or his then you know or one of his other names <laughs> stamped onto it uh we're in the 200s and it is insurmountable. But we're looking at this as 182 movies with maybe a few squeaking by. Um, it really depends. Anyway, for today's file, we'll be looking at the, the awful Dr. Orloff, Shining Sex, and Oasis of the Zombies. Now, I will do my best not to spoil these too much for those that haven't seen them. This is very much um, an introductory uh, sort of course, I guess. I'm, I'm learning a lot about these as you guys are as well. If you know a lot about Jess Franco, if you're already a big fan of Jess Franco, a lot of this information will probably not be too new to you. Um, but I, I think that we together can 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 help to push the appreciation for Jess Franco. And that's really the the point of this segment is to figure out what makes Jess Franco so uh, fascinating for so many people. Um, the uh, director of Brotherhood of the Wolf and uh, Silent Hill, Christopher Gans. Or Gans? 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 I don't know. I'm not French. Uh, he uh, has a special feature on the Shining Sex Blu-ray from Severn, which I will be getting. I'll be doing a, a review of. Mm, I like that. Okay. Um, sorry. The, <laughs> YouTube did a weird thing, and I had to like, ah. Oh. Um, let's see. Uh, what was I talking about? Uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf and. Let's see. We'll start with I'm not French, I guess. I, God damn it. I really, I hate, this is a side note that I'm probably going to cut out, but I fucking hate the current way that YouTube does its live stuff. It is so frustrating to deal with. <laughs> I fucking hate it so much. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, Chris forgot, oh, uh, I will be doing a review of um, the uh, Severin Blu-rays that were recently uh, released, um, Franco-wise. Uh, I have a very special video. I hope it'll come out very soon. It's just taking a lot of time to prepare. But um, Christopher Gans, in in the uh, in this special feature that he's in, he says, "quote Franco's art is more musical than cinematic," and I think that um, that's a big part of why so many people are obsessed with Franco. People who you know you wouldn't expect to be people who normally would be all about art, man. Um, and I mean he is art, but you know what I mean, like. High class art, you know, people that are, you know, uh, Eric Roma types, uh, people, you know, watching Fellini flicks. You'd think that, you know, oh, he's not, you know, the, this guy is no Hitchcock. Why, why, why do you care so much about him? And I think a lot of it has to do with that sort of like weird experimental jazz aspect to Jess Franco. Um, so back to Christopher Gans, actually, he, he, he argues that filmmakers should be measured basically under their own separate merits. He uses the examples of uh, like narrative merit, musical, architectural, uh, further stating that Franco should be viewed as music. Um, his movies shouldn't be viewed for narrative uh, art. They should not be viewed necessarily architecturally. They should be viewed as music. And if you look at look at them as jazz, uh, he, he references Chet Baker. Uh, Jess Franco was a big fan and I believe friend of Chet Baker. Um, you get a better idea for what you're kind of going into. And I think that's very important. I know that when I first started watching Franco, uh, I was very befuddled by what the fuck I was looking at. Uh, I was intrigued and I liked it, but I was very much like, what the fuck is going on here? And 
once I heard that musical thing, it really all hit. I, I, I had thought of the jazz aspect kind of, but I hadn't really uh, put it forward as, you know, measuring it as music. And that, that, that makes it um, kind of more special, I guess. Uh, anyway, he also, uh, he talks about grouping Franco films in periods because what you see throughout Franco's career are a series of micro careers with their own ups and downs. I have not been able to really ascertain how close that is. I'm assuming he's correct because he really fucking loves Jess Franco, but I haven't watched enough yet to really uh, dig in to that aspect. But um, I'm hoping that as we go through Jess Franco's filmography, we can really get a pretty solid idea of um, what made him so special uh, and how those micro careers work. Um, we can maybe, once we've reached, um, you know, all the films of a certain period, we can go back and really trace that period and see how these came to be, how they work thematically together. We can really get a good idea. So I'm, I'm very excited uh, to go through these. Uh, oh, another quote I have written down. Uh, he says that Franco was the Orson Welles of soft porn. And I think that is quite possibly the greatest description of Jess Franco in existence. Uh, Orson Welles, of course, went on to be a very experimental filmmaker in his later years. Uh, and really, I guess, was an experimental filmmaker his entire career, now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, but uh, it's it, this whole, the whole Jess Franco kind of mystique, the, the um, philosophical kind of um, arc that makes up his work, I'm finding it extremely inspiring. Like, it's, uh, I, I get why these filmmakers and critics and people like Stephen Thrower are so infatuated because it really is this this technique feels like such a, a, a fucking twenty twenty word. It's this technique that very much doesn't give a fuck about the establishment. Jess Franco, you know, he didn't care what his producers wanted. He didn't care what the world wanted or what the world thought of him. He just made the art that he wanted to make. A lot of it just his wife's pussy, but you know. He, he, he liked what he liked. Um, and I think that that is fucking rad. Uh, he's quite possibly the most rad filmmaker ever to exist. So hats off to Jess Franco. And I'm really excited to start this project. Uh, we will be ranking these films as well. Uh, this will not be an exact science by any means, but it does offer a little bit of fun to the process and allows me to, to go back and reconsider the films we've talked about with future guests, which we will have guests. I do have that kind of starting to get lined up. I'm just, you know, I'm also, I'm running a YouTube page, man, my dad, I, 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 a lot of stuff going on. Uh, and, um, but, uh, yeah, we'll go back, reconsider the films we've talked about future guests. Uh, that list will be on Letterboxd, and I'll add the link to the Letterboxd list uh, in the show notes for you guys to, to follow or whatever. Um, anyway, let's talk about um, his first, his first big film. This is not necessarily his, this is not his first film. This was, I believe, his Fifth film? Fifth or sixth? I think it's his fifth. Uh, scholar, Michael. Um, the Awful Dr. Orloff, 1962. Uh, now, Stephen Thorne notes this is where Franco's career really began, so it makes sense for us to start with it. Uh, it's uh, available through Kino Lorber, uh, through the uh, Redemption um, uh, series of, uh, of releases. And uh, original, so basically, originally, Franco wanted uh, to make an adaptation of a sort of anarchy-fueled book by Bruno Traben, uh, and that's the guy who wrote Treasure of the Sierra Madre. So you can see, can imagine like the kind of anti-capitalist anarchy screeds that might um, uh, form this this potential film. And of course, the Spanish uh, Ministry of whatever the fuck film I don't remember what it's called, but <laughs> the Spanish government was like, mm, no. And they decided that at the very last minute when everything was set up, they had everything basically ready to go. Uh, and the government was like, mm, Shana, nah, we're not going to do this. And no, thank you. No, thank you. And uh, so uh, the producers and Franco, they were forced to find something to do with what was basically a production ready to go. And as the story goes, they took in a screening of The Brides of Dracula, Hammers, The Brides of Dracula, and wound up with Franco writing his own horror tale, Gritos in la Noche. Uh, now, this film would open in March of 1962, and it would be Franco's biggest success yet. Five films into that career. Uh, he uh, had already shown that he had a good eye. He had shown he could work with actors. Um, he had a, a good reputation, which he was, he was soon going to just scatter to the wind. But 
for now. He had a good reputation, and this was the one that really showed that he was something to watch or someone to watch. And it was also, by most accounts, the first real horror film from Spain. And there have been other films that kind of dealt with the macabre before, but this was like the first real horror film. And it was, it's a grisly flick. And it is, by 1960s standards, pretty fucked up and pretty scary. Um, the, the plot is a curious mix of basically Frankenstein, Dr. Caligari, and Eyes Without a Face, mostly the latter. Uh, although Franco claimed to have only uh, seen that film after making Dr. Orloff. And he, him and the director, actually, um, they, I guess they became friends, or at least, uh, you know, talked. And they decided amongst themselves that there was no way that Franco could have um, could have taken from Eyes Without a Face. Uh, that is debatable, but Franco was well known to have kind of been very um, upfront about his influences. So I don't know why he would need to, to lie about that. Uh, anyway, so uh, here's a, the plot. Um, basically, there's a string of murders in a small French town, and uh, Inspector Tanner is on the case. Now, Inspector Tanner, uh, he is not, like, the worst detective in the world, but he is definitely not, like, he's no Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and he's engaging in some romance with his fiance, who's a talented ballerina named Wanda Bronski. And meanwhile, these murders are being committed by the nefarious Dr. Orloff and his defigured servant, Morpho. Uh, and Morpho has these bulging eyes that are exceptionally unsettling. Uh, especially for, again, an early 60s production, it's really fucked up. Orloff uh, is trying to create a perfect facial skin transplant for his daughter's burned visage. Of course, Wanda winds up with a striking resemblance to his daughter, because movies, and luck being what it is, she quickly takes an interest in the case after a brief interaction with the mysterious killer scientist. So she goes undercover, and, well, uh, she basically does Tanner's job for him uh, until he eventually manages to intervene, and the movie does its thing. It's it's very much, it, it, it feels like a Universal or Hammer uh, gothic horror movie, just in French. It is a, this is a Spanish production, but it's all in French. We'll get into it. Um, amongst them, there's a lot of positive traits. Um, my favorite is probably the use of uh, Inspector Tanner as just like a, a really ineffectual hero. Like he doesn't, it's not that he doesn't try. Um, it's not one of those things where he's just like a schlub who doesn't want to try hard or whatever. He's legitimately trying to be a good detective on this case. He's trying to find the killer and he's doing a reasonably good job. But, uh, Wanda, after, after she, um, kind of acts as this, uh, undercover, or when, when, when she, she has an interaction with the man that she thinks is the killer and she goes undercover it really becomes more of her story and she really like pushes the plot forward and is the one to really do most of the hard work. Uh, and there's even, there's a whole bit of tension with uh, Tanner not paying enough attention to what she's doing and what's going on around him. And things almost take a very dark turn. Um, well, things almost take another dark turn. There's a lot of dark turns. In this movie. Um, but anyway, it's uh, she she winds up basically uncovering everything while also acting as a damsel in distress, which is uh, for the early sixties a pretty fresh and progressive idea. It really it it pushes this idea that couples need to work together rather than just remain stuck in their uh, like preassigned societal roles. It's 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 some dope messaging, and it's very plainly laid out for a Franco script. It is very plainly laid out. It is not confusing. There's not really anything like overly artsy about it. It actually, you know, it, it, it feels like a pretty, uh, not standard film, but a, a, a film, uh, that is very much of a time and not necessarily purely Franco. And that's, uh, that's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. I, I like, uh, I like that he, he, started off his career by making films that were commercially of interest, if only because it proves that he was not just some hack. He didn't just make bad movies. He made legitimately good ones. And and Dr. Orloff is very much a legitimately good film. I think if you put this out in, you know, the U.S. and it was like an American production, uh, you know, like a uni you know, under the universal banner, give it a few extra shekels, it would be a, a serious classic of modern cinema. Or not modern, <laughs> it'd be a classic of 1960s cinema. But um, now, okay. So as 
as with most Franco joints. This is something that's we're going to come up to a lot. There are multiple versions of this film. Uh, for my initial viewing, I used the Redemption Blu-ray from Kino, as I said, which contains the 86-minute French version, which is considerably shorter than the original 93-minute Spanish version. Now, the French version contains more explicit material, including Morpho getting himself a handful of exposed titty. Uh, the Spanish version uh, contains far more dialogue, more scenes of the comedic drunk character Jeannot, who is legitimately fucking great and at least one bit of additional business in the opening attack scene that leads to a continuity error in the French release. So there's a bunch of little differences. Nothing that I would say is necessary. I don't, I don't think I missed any of that material, but it's definitely, you know, it's a cut version. Um, so um, who said this? I think it was Stephen Thrower. I just wrote down a quote. Um, I think it was Stephen Thrower that said, however, no one in Spain had yet thought to combine the gothic trappings of the universal horror films, the, journal, the German stylings of expressionist cinema, and the burgeoning eroticism of the Hammer films. And uh, that's, that pretty much, I mean, that basically explains away why this was so good, is Jess was a horror fan. He loved movies, he loved comics, he loved books, he loved pulp, uh, he loved the classics, he loved movies. Um, and I, you know, in a way, he was, he was, he was doing that, uh, not to be too mainstream with it, but he was kind of doing that Tarantino thing, where you just take all the little elements that you like, and you smush them together, and you make a sort of, uh, sort of loaf, a sort of, uh, a movie loaf, if you will. Now, um, even the, so the setting of Orloff works in favor of Franco's kind of experimental mixing of elements. Uh, which, you know, that would that would define his career. His entire career is just mixing together elements. He would just find, like, oh, this is a lens that I really like using, so I'm going to make a movie based around using this lens, and he would fucking do it. I really like this technique. I'm going to make a movie around this. And he'll take, like, okay, well, that works with this thing and that thing, and ooh, ooh, I shot some footage of this that other time. We'll slap that in there. And he would do these kind of freeform jazz productions, uh, Orloff not being one of them. Uh, by any means, but it is showing that sort of early sign of uh, what he would wind up doing so much of. Now, um, <clears throat> as Thrower notes regarding the film's uh, questionable location, uh, this is what he says, quote, the film was shot in Madrid, but there's something a little Slavic about certain exteriors, all of which helps to suggest a pan-European netherworld, some tiny obscure country tucked in between the well-known European giants. Um, now, in reality, I, I'm not sure why Thor doesn't mention this in his review. It might be my mistake. It might be that I misread something. But the Spanish government was very insistent that like horrific stories like this didn't take place in Spain itself. And he might have mentioned this in, in other parts of the book. I haven't finished his books yet. Um, I've been kind of like sifting through just the movies that I've seen so far. But, um, but yeah, the, the Spanish government, they, were, they didn't like that kind of stuff taking place in their country. Because it, it, it gave a bad idea of what the Spanish country was like. Of what, the Spanish, what Spain was like, is what I'm trying to say. What Spain was like. Um, so, uh, and, and that's kind of like, um, it's very similar to places like Italy and Soviet Russia, uh, which also very much did not want people to think that that sort of thing would happen in such an enlightened place. Uh, actually, Soviet Russia, that's a um, very small tangent here. I was reading um, the last book on the left. Hmm. I was reading the last book on the left and uh, the chapter on Andre Chikatilo. One of my favorite parts of that story, and I mean, well, favorite, one of the most um, frustrating parts of that story is that one of the reasons Andre Chikatilo was such a dominating serial killer, uh, killed, I think, 55 people, uh, is because the Soviet authorities were so unwilling to say just out and out, hey, there's a serial killer on the loose. Because, of course, you don't want to show that this perfect communist um, utopia uh, could possibly be fallible. And you, you see that a lot in, uh, in, in, in the movies of that period, in those countries, uh, where there, there were these very fascist rules going on. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of censoring cinema to make it look better, which is so, so dumb. Uh, if, if, you, if you think a movie represents a country or represents a type of person, uh, what about my good mic? What's going on? 
Pa, 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 pa. I don't know which uh, which good mic you're talking. This is the problem is I can't hear shit because of this fucking OBS. And now I'm now I'm worried. Um, what's the thing I was gonna do? I think what I I think what might be going on. Let's see here. Pop pop pop. Hmm. Sounds a little tinny. Well, that's frustrating, but it's not. Let's see. Oh. Ba, ba, ba. Oh, fuck. Wait, no, that's not it either. What could that be? Wait a second. Uh, well, it's this one. Huh. I don't know. I don't know why it sounds a little tinny. I wish someone had mentioned that before. Uh, it's not a webcam. Let's see. I'm gonna do a little testy test. Pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. That's not good. What could it be? Uh, uh, there's no way. There is no way. Wait a second. Let me try something. Uh, 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 that's not that. What could be going on here? I wonder. Ah, uh, man, I I tell you, OBS and between OBS and YouTube, I'm like just driving, being driven fucking crazy. Any 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 time, um, any time there's a there's a technical problem, please let me know because there's like 18 different factors here. Um, oh, don't mention I, I'm not looking at Discord, man. Um. Let's see here. I'm going to try something real quick. Give me one second. I apologize. Doop a doop a doop. Let's see. Uh, let's turn. Pop, 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 pop. Okay, well, let me just do a thing real quick. Okay, well, that's fun. God damn it. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> wow, that is, uh, that's frustrating. That's very frustrating. I, uh, yeah, I was trying to be smart and use my Raycons. Uh, because my headphones weren't working properly because I couldn't hear the uh, music. I wonder, let's see, with the desktop speakers on. Nope. Man, that's so frustrating. <sighs> wow, 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 wow. Man. Okay, yeah, next time, if there's something wrong, please tell me um, because I don't have I don't have anyone monitoring me. I, I, it's just me. Um, so I, I have to, I have to, uh, just assume things are going well most of the time. And, uh, of course, I think, I think what happened was I, I changed a setting while I was trying to get the goddamn themes to play. Um, and I didn't change it back and then it automatically decided the Bluetooth should be, um, yeah. Okay, well, I'll have to put a note in the thing saying that the audio kind of sucks for, like, half the goddamn show. That's annoying, but all right. Okay, um, so what was I even talking about? <laughs> God damn it. Ah, uh, it's so frustrating. Um, I'm all sweaty and gross. Ugh, Jesus. Oh, man. This is, this podcast thing is going off without a goddamn hitch, tell you what. Okay, um... So, let's see here. 
And here I was like, you know, up on the mic, like trying to be, trying to be a good, proper podcaster piece of shit. No wonder we were like fluctuating listeners. That explains it. Wow. Um, all right. So let's see, where was I in my notes? I'll just, okay. So, um, so thrower notes regarding the film's kind of questionable location. Um, the film was shot in Madrid, but there's something a little Slavic. Uh, oh, okay. Now I remember what we're talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, man, you guys, jeez, ah, fell asleep at the wheel. Um, all right, so I was talking about um, Andre Chikatilo uh, and how these countries um, just ne- they would not uh, allow certain things to be said. And for some reason, Stephen Thoreau doesn't mention that as a possibility. Um, I started listening to Tim Lucas's commentary on the Blu-ray, but I'm going to be honest with you, Tim Lucas is very boring to listen to. <laughs> um So the film takes place, according to Tim Lucas, in 1912 on the French-German border, which makes more sense, um, or which makes some sense, rather, of the French text throughout set against the fictional town of Hartog. Everything's written in French. The French is the dialogue for the main movie, uh, but the town is called Hartog, which is, of course, a very German-sounding name. Uh, And, uh, yeah, I I, I like, I love the, the look of the town it has a again that very gothic feel but it also does feel like you're just you're anywhere and that's another thing that's going to crop up a lot in franco's work is that feeling of anywhere a lot of his movies take place somewhere who knows it's just a place and he tried to shoot in places a lot that were um kind of ambiguous and could be just about anywhere a lot of resorts um now the uh, the cast is really solid. Uh, the one I would like to really put out there is Howard Vernon. Uh, he's the actor who played Count Orloff. He's Swiss, or was Swiss, I guess. And he would go on to work on on many more t- more films with Franco. Um, and and frankly, I'm I'm excited to see them work more. The dude has some great facial expressions. He has a very um, kind of almost silent movie look to him. And uh, I really enjoyed his performance, uh, but everybody in the movie is pretty solid. It's a it's a uniformly just good film. And uh, the other thing to note is the score. Franco's filmography is ripe with musical experimentations and oddities, uh, calling back to Franco's lifelong love of music and specifically jazz. And this is no exception. The soundtrack is fucking weird as shit for very very long portions. The the opening murder scene especially is this very like. I don't know what the fuck's going on, but somebody has instruments and they're certainly using them. And um, yeah, so overall, Dr. Orloff is a wonderfully atmospheric entry in the pantheon of gothic monster movies. And while I know that Franco would take some pretty sharp turns in his career, it's nice to know that he started off by showing just how well he could direct a more commercially pleasing film. And it's just cool to see a fucking good movie. Um, it, you know, it's, it's almost like it's, it's the, uh, it's that first drug to get him hooked. You know, I, I would definitely, if you're looking to get into Franco, uh, or you're trying to get someone else into Franco and they don't have a very, let's say a weird sensibility, uh, Dr. Orloff is a great place to start. Um, cause it is a, just a genuinely good film. Now, next up, we're going to jump ahead a few years to 1977. And this is in the middle of, actually, this is the beginning rather of um of Jess Franco's infatuation with Lena Romay uh who he would shoot a lot of uh, a lot of his output in this latter half of the decade and into the 80s would be all about just just her body um there are whole films made just to show off Lena Romay's body to get really tight close-ups of that snatch and uh close-ups that snatch he does get there are a lot of just close-ups of that woman's vagina and you know what good for him good for him uh and if you like just if you like tight shots of pussy fucking you're gonna enjoy this this is um a little bit after i think uh justine 69 is that right um it was like the big one that they did together where she first showed off her 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 shaved vagina i don't know how else to put it um but uh, this is a more of um, this is a follow up to that. That's more of his mentality. I know he wasn't happy with that film, uh, and uh, this seems like more something that he just made because it's fuck. It's his movie. Um, now I'm probably gonna come back to Shining Sex more when we do 
uh, or we discuss Midnight Party, which was shot concurrently with Shining Sex and is by all accounts a very different film in terms of just about everything. But it was shot uh, at the same hotel with the same actors uh, and it was shot in secret. Uh, it is also, as Stephen Thrower notes, basically an avant-garde sexed up rehash of the plot for the diabolical Dr. Z, which, uh, I know someone mentioned that one being pretty dope. Um, but, uh, it's a film I haven't seen yet, so I can't really remark on it. It is on the big list. Uh, but what I, I really want to include it in this inaugural episode because it's fresh on my mind and it adds a flavor to the Franco mythos that we'll be seeing time and time again, and that is that idea of a secret film. Now, the thing about Jess Franco's secret films is they are, uh, morally speaking, kind of bad. Um, and I don't mean the film itself. I mean the um, conditions under which they were made. I don't think you could get away with this nowadays. We are in a very... Um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, we you're you're into legal you like to sue people uh litigious um we're in a very litigious uh, uh society and a hundred percent franco would be sued into oblivion real fast because there's no way you could hide this kind of thing now um back then however he was able to hide it and for several of his films they were just filmed using the finances of the film he was making, but they were not being made for that producer. Oftentimes they were being made and then sold to someone else. And so that is a very big legal no-no. And Franco throughout his career would often say, no, I, I didn't do that. Um, but he, uh, he did that. And he confided in, in closer friends, um, that he did fucking do that. And he, he, had, and you know what? It's, it's, it's wrong, but it's fucking awesome at the same time. It's one of those just super metal things that you wouldn't do now, but if you look back, it's, it's pretty fucking tight. Um, and I, I love that. Now, as far as the plot for Shining Sex. Um, the plot to Shining Sex. Basically, Lena Romay plays a stripper. And she, uh, she goes back to a, a hotel room with this guy and this chick who are kind of weird. The guys are always wearing sunglasses. Actually played by her boyfriend at the time, I believe. Her husband. Um, and they go back to the hotel room and there's some fucking in, and then there's this weird gel that's full of like, um, <laughs> Matt, Matt says, yes, please give us a plot summary for shining sex because I have no idea what I watched. It's, it's tough. So, okay. So she goes back, she fucks, uh, this chick named alpha, uh, and she eventually fucks the dude as well. And, they spread this uh, glittery gel on her and it forces her to do Alpha's bidding. And Alpha sends her to go and basically kill via fucking these three different people. One of them played by Jess Franco, who's like a psychic uh, scientist man guy. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that Alpha is from another dimension uh, these are not spoilers, by the way. These are helping you to understand what the fuck you're watching, Urs. Uh, and so it turns out Alpha's from a different dimension, and she's killing off the people who she suspects knows about her race, her, her plan. It, that's a little that's a little iffy, but uh, basically, it is a sweeted version of uh under the skin that, that scarlett johansson flick under the skin it's basically that except there's no physical way of of telling that that's what's happening um there's no like big alien machinery there's not any special effects it's all either narration dialogue or the fact that she has glitter all over her body <laughs> um at one point she basically teleports to a place that might be Africa. I don't know. I mean, it's in France. It's all in France, but I think it's supposed to be in Africa. And and that's the movie. Um, it is, and it has a very somber ending, and it's, it's borderline Lovecraftian in a weird way, except chock full of fucking. There is so much fucking in this movie. And that's another thing that's fascinating about Shining Sex, is it's not like... So there's, there's shots of, of vaginas, there's shots 
of there's a shot of an erect penis, at least one. Uh, there's full on lesbian fuck sessions. Uh, there's the the you get the backside of the dude thrusting himself inside. But there's not any actual fucking and there's no penetration. So this isn't technically a hardcore porno. It's kind of a softcore porno, except most softcore pornos don't show genitalia. So it's this weird, again, we come back to that thing again and again. It's a mix. It is a mix of genres. Now, this was, again, the 70s. So this was a time where filmmakers were kind of pushing boundaries and trying to figure out what exactly was and wasn't um, porn. Uh, and of course, you know, I mean, this is the time where celebrities were dating porn stars and porn stars were celebrities. And there were movies like, you know, like Caligula, basically, uh, where it was like, is is this OK? I'm not sure. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it it's a weird film. It is not something I'd watch with the family. I actually watched this on my computer because I felt really weird watching it with my 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 son. Um, now, I mean, he, he's not you know, he's not watching the TV. He doesn't know what's going on. But even then, I was like, this is. This is awkward. I'm not going to watch this in the living room. <laughs> this is very much a computer only or after everybody else goes to bed movie. Um, and, you know, I was I was expecting fucking I was not expecting as much just close ups of because when I say close ups of Lena Romay's vagina, I mean, like it it fills the frame uh, and it is. You know, it's a pussy <laughs> um, anyway. So, uh, I did this, I did this thing where I keep on writing down quotes that I, and I don't remember where they come from. I think this is also Stephen Thrower, uh, saying, quote, the void stillness absence. These are constant factors in Franco cinema. Uh, and that's the thing again, like there's a lot of just like these borderline static shots, watching things occur, very little dialogue for the most part, just following characters and, there's this like absence of time. You're never really sure when things are happening, where things are happening. Uh, and that's another thing that we're going to come back to again and again. Uh, now, Franco, he made a little, let's say. Oh, sorry. I'm kind of working through my notes here. Um, now, Shining Sex, uh, it is my favorite of this batch. I'm just going to spoil that right now. It's definitely my favorite of these three movies. Uh, there is a better film we'll talk about on another episode, but I want to save that for a little while so I can rewatch it. Uh, Matt says it reminded me a little of the Manifel to Earth. That is a very good comparison, actually. Um, it is the is yeah the erotic version of the Manifel to Earth. The Manifel to Earth, by the way, a film that already has a lot of fucking in it and and features David Bowie's penis. So if you ever want to watch, if you want to watch, if you want to look at David Bowie's peen, uh, check out the Man Who Fell to Earth. One of my favorite movies. One of my uh, favorite Criterion releases. From back in the day, too. I uh, I remember buying that at the FYE. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, it, I, I would I would wager that Doctor Orloff is the better made film. Like it's definitely the one pe more people will enjoy. Uh, <laughs> however, Shining Sex is just it's so audacious and of its own that I really can't help but prefer it. So big points to Shining Sex. Just a solid film. Uh, again, Seven released the Blu-ray. It's a really solid Blu-ray. Uh, but if you want to wait for a while, I will have a uh, review of that on the YouTube channel soonish. Now, next up, last one that we're going to talk about. Uh, and just in time, we have seven minutes left here. Uh, I'm going to add a few minutes because we had that whole microphone kerfuffle. So, Waste of the Zombies. Uh, this, we're fast-forwarding to 1981. Uh, Oasis of the Zombies, Oasis of the Zombies, was my first dip into the waters of Franco just being Franco. Um, and by the way, this is, I actually have it right here. This is another Redemption uh, release uh, from Kino. And it's not its not a very packed release. Uh, the only extra feature, or extra features, I guess, are trailers. You can also, there's the English dub version, the French version. That, that's it. And it is the, it's the, um, I think it's, sl we'll get into it. Um, so, uh, Oasis of the Zombies. Uh, this, okay, so this is Franco being Franco. Narrative be damned. Uh, I literally had next to no idea 
what had happened over the course of the film until I read Stephen Thrower's synopsis in Flowers of Perversion. Uh, it is com- like just l- let me actually I'm going to quote Stephen Thrower real quick again. If the aim of this book is to turn more people on to Jess Franco, I cannot in good faith say anything to ameliorate the poor quality of this movie. And that is very accurate, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so this was Franco's first foray uh, into the zombie genre. Uh, this was after dropping out of Eurocine's previous effort, Zombies Lake, uh, directed by Jean Rollin. Uh, and, uh, which became a very, a film that is definitely not a Jess Franco film. Let's put it that way. Uh, and, uh, some of the dumbest looking zombies, which is crazy considering what we're talking about right now. So it, it, it makes very little sense. Uh, our ostensible lead character is meant to be college age, but the film takes place in the 1980s, I guess. And he was born around World War II. Now, this shockingly youthful 38-year-old brings along his college friends to go on a trip from London to Libya, despite making it very clear that this would be very problematic for their schooling. Uh, Now, a professor meets our college kid protagonists in Libya, but we're given zero understanding as to who he is and what he's doing there. He has a film crew with him. I guess they're making a documentary. Uh, And there's a couple characters who are wounded by zombies, but never turn into zombies. And that's like tip of the, that's just like general notes for the movie. This movie, when, where's my phone? Um, this movie, once you like read the synopsis, it makes more sense. And you can go back, rewatch it, and probably, probably enjoy it more. I haven't rewatched it yet. I've only watched, I've only watched all these once so far. Um, and yeah, I, I think you could enjoy it more, but it still makes very little sense. There's very little zombie action. Uh, Jess Franco did not love gore. He was not a big fan of um, special effects gore. Um, and he also apparently didn't give a flying fuck about this movie. And so there's, there's you know, there's... A, very few special effects, and B, the special effects that, e- effects that exist uh, are are not great. Uh, I wouldn't call them the worst. They're entertaining, but they're not great. Uh, there's actually, there's one zombie head that's, it's well, it's supposed to be a zombie head, but it's actually just like a puppet on a pole, and it's just the head, and you can see like where the pole is like, no, 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 uh, the zombie head, and it, it looks... It, it, I mentioned uh, the last film's feeling, feeling like a Sweeted film, and th- it, it, this feels like a Sweeted film because it, there's no way the budget for these special effects would even cover catering on most movies or even just Franco movies. Um, and uh, oh yeah, and as Matt uh, notes, uh, so Jean Roland and uh, and and Jess Franco had a weird kind of contentious relationship. Uh, Roland was called in to direct some extra scenes with zombies for Virgin Among the Living um, Dead? Dead? Or is it just a Virgin Among the Living? Virgin Among the Living, yeah. Um, And yeah, they had a contentious relationship. Uh, And this was basically uh, Eurocine Eurocine? Eurocine um, went, okay, well this movie made a lot of money. Jess didn't want to do this movie. Let's uh let's let's give him another shot. Let's try to see if he'll do a zombie movie for us because we need to make more money. And Jess was like, oh, "Fine, fuck it, whatever." And what we wind up with uh, are you know some some mixed results. There are some beautiful shots. There's some solid makeup interspersed with some of the more laughable bullshit. Um, and like there's so there's like uh okay, it is a virgin among the living dead. Thank you, Matt. Um, th- and there's some there's some makeup effects that. <sighs> are of of their own quality uh shot wise we do get some really uh beautiful shots of like some zombies on some dunes uh, we also get a lot of stock footage um they basically just took and i i honestly i think i think steven thrower actually mentions this too uh I, i'm firmly in the camp that they had stock footage from this other war movie and they were like we need to do something with this okay you need to set this zombie movie in the desert because it's gonna be in an oasis let's do it that way because it'll fit this footage 
and um, that, that that's what it feels like. Um, now, uh, there is there is something endearing about how little Franco seems to care about commercial viability in this, uh, and it does have a kind of hypnotic feel to it like the way it's edited the way it's shot i i was intrigued i did find myself bored in parts because again it just it goes on forever and it makes no sense and so you don't really have anything to hook into because you're constantly like what the fuck am i even watching but it still has enough going on that is uniquely franco including that just fuck it i'm not even gonna have a lot of zombies in my movie kill yourself (laughs) kind of mentality that just franco had um but with that being said, we will return to Oasis um, eventually uh, because we are going to have to talk about the Spanish version, which is titled uh, La Tumba de los Muertos Vivientes, uh, a.k.a. Tomb of the Living Dead. Uh, this version is more or less the same, but it features Spanish actors in reshot scenes to secure a Spanish tax credit. Um, and it's a whole nother mess, but it, it is... It does have some substantial differences. I don't think it's included in my list that I made of uh, all of the unique Jess Franco movies. I think I included that as um, just one of the re-edited versions. Um, but I would like to find it eventually. I don't, I've don't. i not been able to find a version of it so far. But if I can find it, I would like to talk about that and do a compare and contrast. Um, it'll probably be its very own episode, I guess. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, no, I, and I have not, so I have not watched Tomb of the Living Dead. I, I want to, it's, I don't, I just don't know where to find it at the moment. Uh, I, I read about that one in the Stephen Thrower book, uh, which for my, for my listeners, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show off my booty real quick, cause I ain't wearing, I, ain't, oh, well, you can't actually see my lack of pants. So this is the book I'm using as my main resource. Uh, now this one's Murderous Passions. Uh, there is this is Volume One of Stephen Thurer's Jess Franco um, uh, compendium, and it is fucking massive. Uh, they're both this size. Uh, for the l- people who are listening to the podcast version, it's a thick book, and um, it's 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 extremely uh, illuminating, and it's really helping me get through and kind of understand what I'm watching for some of these. Uh, and anyway, yeah, I the the, the thing I want to end with on Oasis of, Oasis of the Zombies, uh, and actually, oh, this is good. Yeah, uh, uh, Guru Works says um, I got to say Oasis of the Zombies really caught my attention. It's hard to say why. Really loved that hy- hypnotic tone to it, and that's that's exactly right. Uh, it is a very hypnotic film, and I think that's true of a lot of these movies. Shining Sex also has that kind of hypnotic tone, although I would say it's a far better film. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to this. If you want to kind of keep up with me on this journey, uh, I, I will tweet about the movies I'm watching. I will try to keep people up to date so you can kind of follow along before I make these episodes. Uh, and of course, you can look at the Letterboxd list um, that I'll be linking in the show notes. Uh, I also, um, you know, if I, I highly recommend these books. They are available, uh, I believe, on Amazon. Uh, you can you can buy them. They're super well made. Uh, also, if you haven't already, um, just as a side note, uh, Splintered Visions, uh, the book that uh, Thrower wrote on Lucio Fulci, is also really great. It's similarly giant, and on Amazon, it says that they're selling the paperback version, which I don't think actually exists. Um, I bought that one kind of, I was kind of sad because like, oh, I, I really want the hard cover, but eh, I'll, I'll settle for the paperback, even though it's super expensive. And then what comes to my door, but a big old chunky hardcover book. Um, so if you really want to uh, just dive into all of my favorite filmmakers, I highly recommend these books. Uh, they're all hardcover. They're all beautiful. Fab Press did an amazing job. Uh, and they are super, super, super informative. Um I, I cannot recommend them enough. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's that's basically it. I, I I really am loving this journey into Jess Franco. We will be have, doing this segment fairly often. Um, I don't know what's exactly going to happen next week. I know that we're going to be looking, unless things go awry, the plan is to do uh, a Under 700 Club, 
with a very special film that I'm very excited to talk about. Uh, and that depends on my guest's availability. But considering the current state of the world, I don't think that'll be a problem. So uh, next episode, theoretically, uh, we'll have a co-host, which is exciting. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm very excited to do all this with you guys. If you have any uh, suggestions about the format of the show, if you have any suggestions for segments, if you have any suggestions for more Jess Franco movies that I should watch, you know, what should I go for? I definitely, I want to watch A Virgin Among the Living Dead, uh, and I really, really want to watch um, his uh, Venus and Furs. Uh, there's a bunch of films of his that I really, really want to watch, so let me know. What, should, what would you like to see me or hear me talk about next regarding Jess Franco? Uh, and yeah, don't forget to buy merch. You can buy by Philip, you can buy shirts with Philip the cat uh, on uh, on my merch page. That's down below uh, in the deets, um, and of course follow me on Twitter and all those other fucking bullshit social media sites. And um, yeah, watch more movies. Uh, watch Franco. Watch Fulci. Uh, go watch Color Out of Space. That shit's dank as hell. It's on Shutter right now. And you know what? Until next time, guys, just, um... Oh, and by the way, I fucked up something. Uh, first off, I, I started that credit the credits a little early, um, but I forgot to change these credits out. I made one mistake uh, in the September credits, and in my last... Um, Thank you, thanks, bet. Kirk, Kirk Cruz is one of our uh, new $10 patrons. Thank you so much, Kirk. You're awesome. Uh, I love you to pieces. You're my favorite gay boy. And uh, I'm sorry that your name is not in the credits. But hey, you fucking rock on, man. G go watch a movie.